Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our virtual college exploration afternoon. This, um, the event you're joining us for is all about the University of Denver, and we want to welcome you today. Really quick, your camera and microphone are off, although our speaker, you can see our speaker, um, she cannot see you, but she will be able to interact with you through the Q&A button on your screen. So feel free to add any and all questions um, as the, the session moves forward. And we also want to remind you that recordings of all sessions will be available at the IACAC.org website. Um, and we encourage you to take advantage of the remaining sessions of this um, multi-week um, event. So without further ado, thanks for being here and I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Hi everyone, I am Jen Parr Gross. Sorry. That's okay, I got it. Hi, I am Jen Gross, the Midwest Regional Director for the University of Denver. Um, it says I'm still muted. Is that true or not? I think we're good now. Okay, so a little technical difficulty there, but I am excited that you are here joining me today. Um, I am going to introduce you to the University of Denver or share some things about the University of Denver if you've already had an opportunity to visit or are familiar with us. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I want to um, provide you some information and this is one of the best ways to do it. And first and foremost, let me get here to slideshows. So this, oops, go back one. So we are actually having a virtual open house the week of October 12th through 17th. And a lot of this is going to be, um, it'll be archived so that you can go back and look at it. But here is the QR code and the actual link on the, um, <clears throat> On the 15th of October, I'm going to do a Q&A panel with students. And on the 17th, we're going to have our different um, departments come and talk about their different programs. So that's on a Saturday. So those are two, to kind of, two areas to kind of pay attention to you. So hopefully you've, hopefully you've grabbed that QR code or you can go back and watch the replay to grab it. So the University of Denver is in Denver, Colorado. And this is a view from campus. You can see we are not in the mountains. We're not in the foothills. We're really on that front range area. So when you look at us from an aerial view in towards the downtown area, we are in Denver proper. Downtown, you can see it up there in the photograph, is just, a, it's about eight miles away from us. And so our students have easy accessibility all around Denver in the metropolitan area with the light rail and the buses and students can ride those for free. So on that north end of campus, you can see that map laid out there. Um, that north end will have the light rail. You can hop on the light rail, get downtown in about 12, 15 minutes, depending on the stops. And then campus itself is 150 acres and it is a walkable campus. You can see from the photograph that we've got residential areas around us. So I like to call it residential with a little bit of urban flair. I always tell students that if Chipotle is a requirement, the first one ever built is three blocks off campus. And in addition to that, we've got a Walgreens within walking distance, grocery stores, there's other restaurants and eateries, there's banks. So there are things right around campus that you have easy accessibility to. When you're looking at <clears throat> the campus map, there's going to be two cross streets. The um, one that goes east-west is Evans and uh, the north-south there on the east side is University and that's where that urban flair is. But we really ha are surrounded by a lot of residential area. In Denver, if you were to be in Denver as a student, you have to be able to handle a couple things. One, there's a lot of sunshine. So you're gonna have about 300 days of sunshine a year minimum. So a lot of vitamin D that we get here in the Midwest. But also it's what's interesting because we're um, located where we are, we've got that higher altitude. When it snows in Denver, it typically melts by noon or one o'clock. Um, our students started school in mid-September that week of Labor Day, our first year students were moving in and we had a two inch snowfall. Didn't stick to the roads or, or the um, walkways, but it stuck to the grass and it was gone by about one o'clock. So really interesting for the weather. Because of the altitude, there's a lack of humidity. We have low to no humidity. So there are no mosquitoes, very few bugs. Always a good hair day. So <clears throat> where students are coming from is a great geographic diversity here. You see 48 states, 15 countries, and less than 30% of our students are coming from Colorado. So that means we're a residential campus. Um, I work with primarily students in the Midwest. So any student from Illinois, I am the one that reads your app application. I'm the one that is there to answer your questions and I will have my contact information uh, towards the end of the slide so you can capture that and be able to reach out to me with any additional questions after this presentation. But you can see it's, it's very diverse and even if you sit in a classroom with, at DU, you're going to have probably a, a diverse class of people coming from all over, sometimes more diverse than some of the smaller colleges that are out there. 
Denver itself is 3 million in population. So I would compare it to a Minneapolis St. Paul size. Um, it's about half or a little less than half the size of the Chicagoland area, um, along with Chicago and the suburbs. But it is really easily accessible. You know, from St. Louis, it's a two hour flight from the Chicago area. It's also a two hour flight, maybe 215, depending on the wind, which way the wind's blowing. I have driven it from the Chicago area. This is where I'm based. And my halfway point is Omaha. It takes about 16 hours to get from Chicago to Denver if you're driving. If you're, you can also take the train. Uh, the train goes right out of Union Station in Chicago and goes into Union Station in Denver. And that's about an 18 hour trip. But then you don't have to worry about driving and you can kind of hang out in the observation car and relax a bit. Denver itself is a great place. I mentioned 300 days of sunshine. Our students can do everything almost all year round. So there's a lot of hiking and biking, a lot of outdoor activities. In addition to that, it's a great music scene, a lot of culture, um, you know, and I mentioned it is a foodie place. It is the second largest tech city in the United States. It is one of the best places for young adults, one of the healthiest cities in the United States. And we have all the government agencies. You really can't go wrong with the Rocky Mountains in your own backyard either. These, this this um, photo, collection of photographs gives you an idea of what you could um, participate in and experience as a student at DU. That top left hand um, corner is the city of Denver. Again, that thriving area offers a lot of things for our students to do, including internships and practical experiences, those opportunities. South, just below that, you see that blue bear. That was designed by one of our faculty members. That blue bear um, is looking into the cultural center. So they have plays and musicals, a lot of different events that go on there. Um, that um, blue bear, you can also see the little miniature if you go into our art department and go into the industrial lab. He's about four inches versus the four stories there. Very thriving city with music. Jazz Fest is one of the things that we have that is a, a steady tradition that happens in Denver. And just below that is Union Station that I mentioned um, for, the tr for those that are interested in taking a train in. Also, you see two mountain ranges there. <clears throat> Silverton is the one that has the snow and the snowboarder. Um, the one with the rainbow is Telluride. So you can experience a lot of different things outdoors, whether it's in the sports or hiking or just enjoying nature. Takabe is one of the food trucks in Denver. It's actually owned by one of our alumni. We have a really strong hospitality management program and so a lot of restaurateurs, not just within Denver, but throughout the United States. One that you might be more familiar with in Illinois is Eli's Cheesecake. Mark Schulman's a DU grad and he owns that. The, um, the Red Rock is Red Rocks. It is on my bucket list. I have not been there, but I understand it is one of the most natural acoustic places in the world. And a lot of the musicians um, that are doing performances would love to perform there if they haven't, just because of that experience. And then you don't have to really go too far away from campus to experience some sort of adventure. This last photo here is um, REI Sports Store. It is downtown and that is a kayaker out on Cherry Creek. So you can do kayaking while you're out there. We are in a residential area, like I mentioned, and you notice most of our students are coming from out of state. So 94% of our first year students are gonna be living on campus, and then 48% of our undergrads live on campus. That surrounding community, you saw the residential with that urban flair. There are some apartment buildings around the area that um, are DU owned and not DU owned. Um, so you can, uh, students can rent houses and those sorts of things as they get into that upper class level. But we have three freshman resident halls on campus and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. Three freshman resident halls on campus, and one is on the north end, one is in the middle, and one is on the south end. And campus is walkable. You saw that map, and you can get from north end to south end in about 15 to 20 minutes, east to west in seven to 10. But then around the community, we have things like the marketplace, um, you know, where they have fresh produce. And again, you can do everything almost all year round, so there's always something going on. Where are things from Denver? Well, here's some of the things in Colorado. Colorado is pretty much a square state, but the airport is typically, if it's 30 miles away, about 40 minutes driving an hour by the light rail because you have to go downtown to pick that up. Colorado Springs is south of us about an hour. Boulder is about 30, 35 miles north of us. And then you have the resort areas. The closest ones are about 90 minutes and those would be Arapahoe and A Basin, but you also have things like Breckenridge Vale and also Aspen. I'd mentioned that you, know, you can do a lot of things outdoors, one of our most popular groups is the Alpine Club, and they do anything that is related to the Rocky Mountain region. Hiking, biking, caving, canoeing, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, snowboarding at a beginner, an intermediate, and an advanced level. So you're able to get involved in some sort of outdoor activity or try something new that you haven't tried before. They typically take a bus up to the different resort areas um, on the weekends, and I don't know if it's the same cost, but 
I remember last it was like $10 and a breakfast, $10 included the round trip and a breakfast burrito. So I don't think you can go wrong with that. Even if it's raised to like 12 or 15, that's really a reasonable price. 71% of our students are going to do at least one internship. When you're looking at a school like our Daniels College of Business, they're going to do at least two. They'll do internships, practical experiences, and they get involved in things right away. Being located where we are and knowing Denver is the thriving city it is, there are a lot of internships and opportunities available, but we don't limit it to that. We have students that will do um, internships on an international level and even go back home and do mentoring and internships. So you've got a lot of experience that you can gain, not only in Denver, but also outside as well. We are a private university for the public good. So we're always giving back to the community. We have over 2,000 of our students that are doing some sort of service or organization or service courses during the year. My best way to kind of describe how it happens at the University of Denver is when I was on campus um, last year, I was there during Homeless Awareness Week. And so while I was walking across campus, there were boxes set up by a group of students that were camping in these boxes, staying overnight in these boxes to kind of create that awareness and start that conversation. But then again, as I walked further on campus and got closer to the admissions building and the business school, there was a group of students building a tiny home. That was our real estate in the built environment program from the Daniels College of Business. So they were doing that as well to create this awareness and start that conversation. So you can see two very different groups doing something different to have that same conversation going on. And I find that happens at DU a lot. Our incoming first year students, um, we ended up with about 1,400 total for this incoming class. We are in our fourth week of um, classes. We have about 6,000, just under 6,000 undergrads and just over 7,000 grads. You've got um, a focus on the undergraduate education. So remember, we have not only our undergraduate education, we have our own law school, we have some PhD programs, and we have continuing education with our Daniels College of Business. So you don't see those students on a daily basis. You're really focusing in with the students that are your peers that are in the undergraduate level. <clears throat> Medium-sized school, about 13,000 students with a lot of offerings, but small school attributes. So you're looking at an average class size that is about 22 students. You've got a 12 to one student faculty ratio. So you have a lot of personal attention. And my favorite number there that's listed at the bottom, 99.9% .9 of our students, our classes are taught by faculty, by professors. That means where's that 0.1%? That is in our, our Lamont School of Music. The 0.1 is that it's actually teaching assistants teaching the music lessons. So your classroom is going to have faculty teaching that. They like to challenge you, but they also like to be challenged back. And it's not uncommon to have conversations that may lead to research later on or even other projects. <coughs> We have five different academic divisions, and I'll go through probably, uh, I'm going to say seven or eight of the top areas for us. And the largest one coming in is the Daniels College of Business. It is one of the oldest business schools in the United States. It's the eighth oldest. It has um, a lot of really st strong, long-standing relationships with well-established businesses, but we also look towards younger businesses um, because there's things that are going to be coming up that we want our students introduced to. Daniels College of Business is very business intentional. It is also one of the schools that does have a direct entry option. Um, if you apply to the University of Denver and are admitted to DU and you receive a merit scholarship and are going into business, you have direct entry into the program. If you don't receive a merit scholarship, you're still in the program, but at the end of freshman beginning of sophomore year, you are actually um, working on a application, which is a resume and a recommendation to get into your specific area of business. But guess what? The direct entry students have to do that too because it's all about the experience that you're gaining. Our natural sciences and math, the biological sciences is our next largest major, ecology, biodiversity, sustainability. Um, you've got um, some really great opportunities with cognitive neuroscience and, and there's um, things like ge geography. So a lot of different areas there. The Daniel Felix Ritchie School of Engineering and Computer Science would be the next largest and I kind of tie that with the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. But those are two really remarkable programs. Our engineering school is not just looking at the problem solving and the creative thinking, but it's looking at what's ethically going on in that field. It's looking at um, bringing in some management skills because not only are you going to manage projects, but you're going to manage people and also those communication skills just for that as well talking with people, communicating visually and verbally. They always do something for the greater good as well. So those senior projects, we're working with our community and always giving back. They also have computer science in there as well as we're one of the oldest gaming programs. When you look at our Corbell School of International Studies, Joseph Corbell 
is Madeleine Albright's dad. That's one Secretary of State. But Condoleezza Rice also got her bachelor and her doctorate from DU in this program. So this program is ranked in the top six in the world. Again, I mentioned we have all the government agencies available to us, but we also have things like public policy, diplomacy, homeland security, and not-for-profit. And this is one of the programs that does go up to the doctoral program, like I said. The next one I would say would be the Lamont School of Music. This is the other school, the other area that does have a secondary admissions process. When you're looking at the School of Music, um, you are applying to the University of Denver, but you're also applying to the School of Music and you're doing an audition. So anybody that's considering it, music as a major will apply in January for us. Um, that's the date that you apply and those, um, inter or, or those auditions will happen in January and February. The arts and humanities and social sciences also have psychology, which is super strong. We go up to PhD, criminology is psychology based, early childhood um, research center on campus, as well as cognitive neuroscience concentration. And I'd round it out with communications and journalism and media studies. We have over 100 different individualized majors, minors, and concentrations. And then we have dual degree programs. We're one of the 16 colleges and universities in the United States that has a six-year law program. So students will do three years undergrad and three years law school, and that's right on campus. And they will get their JD and their bachelor's degree from the University of Denver. We also have um, other dual degrees where you can get your master's in that fifth year and as well as global dual degrees. And for instance, our engineering school and our creative writing program will have a program with the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So it would be three years undergraduate at the University of Denver in your field and then going on to University of Glasgow in Scotland for that senior year, either focusing in on engineering or creative writing, depending which one you're taking and staying that additional year and getting your master's in that program, master of science and engineering or master's in creative writing. So you have an international master's, but a domestic bachelor's, which is pretty cool. We are on the quarter system. So the quarter system for us is a true quarter system because we do offer four. The summer quarter is optional, but this is great because this academic calendar is really unique. There's only about 100 schools out there that operate on a quarter system. So our students will start classes the mid-September, Monday after Labor Day, and their first 10 weeks for that fall quarter will take them right before Thanksgiving. They'll take their finals and then they will head back to home for Thanksgiving, so November 24th, until January 4th. So we get the six week winter break, which is pretty phenomenal. They do offer winter interterm classes at that time that are on campus and both off campus, but they're optional. But I think what's even great about, greater about this is one, it's one trip home if you're on a quarter system with DU and you're there until January back home, or if you're on a semester system at another college or university, you're going home for Thanksgiving, you have to come back for two, two and a half weeks, take classes, take your finals, and then go back home again. And that ends up being three trips. So I think it works out to a benefit for us to have that quarter system. Our students find it to be the right amount of time to get their work done, not so long that it gets drawn out, but not so short that they, they lose ground. Winter quarter is our, our second quarter or in the academic season, and that would go from January to mid-March. Spring break is always mid-March. You come back at the end of March and go to the end of May, beginning of June. So each quarter, you're taking four, maybe five classes. Four classes is a typical course load. So over the course of a year, you're taking 12 to 18 classes, which means as a student coming into a university going four years, you're going to take 30% more classes at a school like the University of Denver on a quarter system than you would at a school on the semester system. And this leads to a lot of really op great opportunities. It gives you a flexibility to do double majors, majors and double minors, triple majors, you know, that all those different multiples that you can pursue. It also gives you um, an opportunity if you are coming in undecided or undeclared. About 30% of our students come in like that, and they don't know what they want to do necessarily. They have areas they're interested in, they have careers they're considering, but how do they get there? How do they find that passion or purpose? A quarter system gives you enough opportunities to try things, and the, even those classes that you don't like, you're not going to lose ground because they'll go towards electives. Other classes, you might come in and say, oh, I've taken psychology. Oh, I just need two more classes to minor in that. I might as well finish that up right now. So it gives you really great flexibility along those lines. Summer quarter, again, is optional. That is, um, is something that students can do if they're interested. 77% of our students study abroad. Over 200 of our students participate in research, and that's undergraduate research every year. And 90% of our graduates are either in that next level of education or in, are employed within six months of graduation. 
So while the quarter system is something that makes us unique, our study abroad program is another thing, but also our research. We have a Center for Undergraduate Research, which allows students, undergraduates, to present a proposal to faculty. Faculty review those proposals and they award $1,500 for students to work on their projects for, for the school year. Um, it can be in any discipline. We had a young lady who was a French horn major who came in and went back and took the money she got for her, her research and went back and built the earliest known French horn. A little different than the modern French horn, so she learned how to play it and her symposium, she, you always presented a symposium and you publish your findings at the end of the year. Her symposium was a concert with that French horn and she published her findings. We've also had a young man that did some DNA sequencing. I, I saw one of my students had done some work on the looking at the energy um, expenditures and uh, with the different residence halls that we have. Um, and how efficient they were. So there's anything that you can do in those areas to do research. You're also able to um, present proposals to go to workshops or seminars or speaker series or um, different conferences related to your field. So that's one thing that you're able to do at undergrad that will help you stand out amongst your peers when you're graduated. Now our study abroad program is really unique in the sense that this is our own program. It is not a consortium program with other colleges and universities, and it's called the Sherrington Global Scholars Program. We have over 150 locations across the globe, and those are vetted and they are approved by our faculty. So we go out to the actual universities and they look at the academics, the opportunities for internships, the students living communities, all those sorts of things. So right now we're at about 150, but we're always adding to that. So we go every place but Antarctica. So if that's on your bucket list, I'm sorry, we don't have it, but we have every other location. One of my um, students from the Midwest ended up going down to Chile and she really wanted to work on her Spanish. I remember talking to her like the second week there, she had um, kind of Skyped in and I was over um, doing a program and her family was there, but I talked to her and she's like, Jen, I don't know if I can handle this. And I'm like, well, what, oops, sorry. I think we advanced a little bit there. I said, what can't you handle? And she's like, I have another mother and I have a curfew. And I've been, I'm a junior, you know, in college, I have my own independence. And I, and I said, Sophie, I'm going to ask you one question. If I took you a mile away from this location, could you find your way back? And she's like, no. And then she paused and she's like, okay, I see where you're getting. And so I had, had, had that conversation with her. I'm not, I'm, I would be the same way. I would feel the same way if I was hosting somebody that I would, knew was not familiar with my area. But I wouldn't doubt that after a few, a few weeks, they're, they're feeling comfortable that you're confident and you know the area. And that's what happened. She ended up taking um, her Spanish, her classes in Spanish and coming back totally fluent. So really great opportunities. One of my other students went to London, interviewed for two internships, turned down ESPN Europe, took the major global marketing firm, had two days a week that was a paid internship, three days a week classes at a London university, and was at soccer games on the weekend. But the interesting program, interesting part of this program is that it is financially affordable for all of our students. That's why 77% of our students choose to study abroad. If you have a 3.0 GPA going into your junior or senior year at the University of Denver, it does not cost you any additional money to study abroad than what you pay for that quarter. So you are keeping all your financial aid, all your scholarships, and then we are going to cover the things like the transportation to and from the location. We're also going to cover other areas like the passport, um, the um, it added insurance, if there's any additional room and board aspects. So those are things that we're going to cover so that our students have an affordable option to study abroad. So as long as you have that 3.0 and are in good standing, you can study abroad in any of our locations and we will add to them if there's a place that you have that you're interested in as long as you work with us freshman year. But you leave in July, at the end of July, beginning of August and come back in December with a semester's worth of credit for a quarter's worth of cost. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. We have 18 different um, division one sports. And so you're looking at um, a school that has, um, well, hockey is when we have our homecoming. We have all of our athletic um, fields up on the north end of campus. So you have the lacrosse stadium, the soccer stadium, tennis courts. You have the multi-purpose area with the gymnasium, um, multi-purpose gymnasium for women's volleyball, natatorium for swimming and diving for men and women. We have the Magnus Arena, which is one of our two ice rinks, but this one's civic center style. So that's where the men hockey, men's hockey has their games. Women's gymnastics has their meet and when men and women's basketball have their games and invitationals. And so then there are two off-campus sports. We actually own our own golf course about eight miles off campus, Highlands Ranch, semi-private. And so that's where men and women's golf teams will have their golfing events. And then we do not own a mountain, but the ski team is one of the most winningest teams in NCAA history across the divisions. They've taken Alpine and Nordic for well over 25 years of the last 30 or so. Um, they 
um, also will be up in the mountains, but again, we don't own the mountain. And then we just added a new sport this, this summer. It's women's triathlete. So those are the sports that we have that are division one. We have club sports that are mimic some of the division ones at a little lesser level, but then we add things like Taekwondo, rugby, water polo, rowing, um, curling, and, and several others. So you have an opportunity to participate on a level of competition that is a club sport reg regionally and sometimes nationally, but you don't have that commitment of a D1 sport. And then intramurals is just within the school. So it might be co-ed volleyball, flag football, broom ball is one of the popular ones. So those are some of the sports that we have that are on campus. We have over 100 different groups and organizations that are available for our students. And we talked about Alpine Club a little bit earlier, but we have academic organizations, religious activities, um, you name it, we have it. And there's clubs that will start up every now and then. One of the clubs that was started by two of my Illinois students and two of my Minnesota students is called Doug's, D-U-G-S. It's called D-U Grilling Society. They grill food. So if you are interested in joining a grilling society, DU has that. But what they do is they will grill food. Um, they have different grills for, you know, vegetarian, the other white meat, beef, but they will grill out for different events that we have on campus. So students can come up and get some free food um, from that grilling society. So there's a variety of things that we have available on campus. So let's take a look at our first year students we have. So our average, um, I like to look at our averages, but I really want to focus in on that middle 50%. A couple things you need to know. We super score ACTs and SATs, but we are test optional. So not every single student submits a test score. So this might be 40 to 60% of our students submitting a test score. You've got a GPA that's a 3.6 to a 4.0 on a 4.0 scale, but they are weighted and non-weighted. So there's no maximums or minimums that we're looking at. We're really looking individually at a student. And this is just really kind of a guideline. I always tell students that if you are thinking, do I submit my test scores, don't I? It's not gonna count against you if you don't. We will look at you equally for admission. We will look at you equally for merit scholarships. But if you're thinking if you should or not, you can always set up an appointment with me. I'll have information at the end here, but also you can go ahead and go by those guidelines. I say if a student typically falls within those guidelines, they probably wanna submit their test scores. Again, we're looking at the type of school, type of curriculum, type of classes, what's being offered at your school. So there's a variety of things that we're looking on this transcript, and we want to make sure that students are going to be successful. We want to see that you're challenging yourself. We want to see what the trend is. Is it an upward trend? Is it a steady trend within the three years, the freshman, sophomore, and junior year you've had in high school? So it's really looking and evaluating everything. When you look at the um, requirements for the application, we only have five. The application, the essay, the application fee, your transcript, and a counselor recommendation. The counselor recommendation can be a letter or the secondary school report. The transcript comes directly from your school. Um, the essay is part of the application, but you can write about anything. And then the applications, there's really two that we'll accept. We'll accept either the common application, which is one that you fill out for several schools, or we'll accept our own application, which is the Pioneer application, and that's a, a, available from us that we send to students that are in our system that we know some information on. So we pre-populate what we know in the application form. So all you have to do is fill in, the, fill in the extra information. Now I know on these forms, they only give you about 10 spaces and about two sentences per space to write your activities down. And remember, we're holistic, we're looking at everything. I want you to brag. And if that's not enough space, please use a second piece of paper or do an activities resume. Tell us everything. This is your opportunity to provide your story, to talk about things you've been involved in, things that you've continued on with, that you have a passion about, that you've taken leadership roles in. And don't just limit it to school. We're looking at church, community, volunteering. You might have a family commitment. Maybe you're taking care of an elderly grandparent, a younger brother or sister. Maybe you have a job. Everybody's different, but it tells your story. Also on the applications this year, there is a place to talk about the pandemic and how it's affected you. So you don't have to necessarily make your essay about that. You've got a space for that. And then I always tell students that if there's something that you think is maybe a hiccup, maybe you had a dip in grade sophomore year and you wanna explain that, there's always the personal statement. That allows us to see that whole story and to know everything you know, that, about you that can help us understand what's going on. The options, additional recommendations and test scores. Um, recommendations, I always say if you're going to submit additional ones, maybe two, at the most three, but make it make at least one of those a teacher who's seen you grow academically. It can be in two teacher recs, it can be a teacher and a coach, a teacher and an employer, but you know, you can submit up to two or three more of those. 
Test scores, again, we spoke about that means test optional. We do have um, a virtual library on our website and we do have a presentation on test optional in DU. And we break it down for you and show you, here's what we would look at with a student that's submitting a test score. Here's what we look at with a student that's not submitting a test score. Basically, we're paying a little bit more weight on the um, transcript and we're bringing in a little bit more with the activities you're involved in. The other thing that we have, we give out over 150 million of our own institutional aid for financial aid. We're a private school. So while we might be more expensive, we have more financial aid to offer. We require two forms, the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and the CSS profile. Those are the two forms that we need for our students to be able to um, award them our own institutional aid. The federal is going to, the FAFSA is going to be the federal and the state, the CSS profile mostly ours. So when you're looking at timelines and deadlines, we have two deadlines um, or two um, application deadlines, November 1st and January 15th. We do have early decision one and early decision two. So we have an early decision component of both of those. The way I best remember it is if you're doing early decision, you're deciding to come, you're deciding to basically marry that school if you're admitted because you're going to go there. So it's a one and done deal. If you're, and I, so I usually focus on the early action and the regular decision because that gives you the time to make that decision. You have until May 1st to make that decision, but if you decide earlier, you can go ahead and deposit earlier at that school you're going to go to and then tell the other schools, you know what, hey, this, I'm going elsewhere, thank you. Um, I've got to break up with you. So, um, but we are not a hard set in stone. Every single thing has to be in by November 15th or, or November 1st or January 15th. We are, let's hit the button and send the application by November 1 and let's get the rest of the information in within the next two weeks. Let's hit the button and send the application by January 15th and get everything in by February 1st. So our early action deadline, students would apply November 1, get everything in by November 15th and their decision will come out the second week of December, maybe the third. The other component to that is if a student is wanting to apply for need-based aid, they would want to fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile by that November 15th financial aid priority deadline. It's not a set in stone deadline. It's a priority deadline that if you get it in by that time, we're going to do everything in our power to have an award for you when you get your, your admissions letter from DU. Um, same sort of thing with January 15th. If you apply January 15th, you hit the button, we'll accept everything within the next two weeks. Um, and then you're considered regular decision. And then as long as you have that FAFSA and the CSS profile done, but for the priority date, you will get that award with your decision letter. But don't worry, if you don't get that information done, that financial aid forms done in time, we're doing that on a rolling basis. This is just a way to give you an opportunity to have that award when you have your decision. So then financial aid. When I was your age, I hid all this stuff under my bed. My dad would ask the question, how much does school cost? And I'm like, I don't know, they don't tell me. This is scary. This is, this is something that I think, you know, is, is out there and it's part of the fit. So I, I looked in state and out of state. And remember, I come, came from Illinois. I ended up getting more money going out of state to a private university than I did staying in state going to a public university. That was my situation. They also have these things called quick cost estimators. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide that it, it'll help estimate your out of pocket costs. What that does, it takes a little bit of information that you provide. If you have a test score, your GPA, um, family financial information, how many kids are in school, it takes all that and calculates what you would have received as a freshman two years ago. So it bases it on a math methodology, not the holistic. So it's going to be not 100%, but it's going to be pretty close. So it will break it down and say, this is the amount you're going to get for a merit award. This is the amount you're going to get for grants that you don't pay back. Here's the scholar, or here's the um, loan award, and here's the work study award. I did this about two months ago, and I ended up was tell, it told me I would get about $41,000 a year in financial aid. So it's really quick and easy to do, and it helps you kind of figure out that financial fit. So we're at 68,000, I'm just rounding it up, 68,000 room board tuition and fees. And that's a lot. But again, remember, 87% of our students are getting some sort of financial assistance from us. That second number in red there, the 17,000 to the 29,000, is what our students are getting for the merit scholarship range. So all you have to do is apply to DU and there's like seven different levels of merit scholarships that you're gonna be considered for. 81% of our funding for financial aid is a merit scholarship or a grant. So that's gift aid that you don't pay back. And 80% of our students do get some sort of merit award. So use the quick cost estimators. Don't rule out a school because of cost yet. When you're looking at um, 
things where there might be special circumstances. You're filling out the FAFSA and the CSS profile. You want to make sure that, um, you know, you're, are you getting all that information you need in? Are there special circumstances that are not being related in these forms? I work with a financial aid partner, and so Roger is one that we connect with if there's any questions on financial aid. He knows the rules and regulations, he's doing the awarding, but he can also look at those special circumstances too. Because right now with the pandemic going on, things have changed and financial, financially things have changed for families. So we will we'll look at those when that time comes. I've been talking a lot. <coughs> Okay, so that is my presentation. I want to give you this information so that <coughs> you can, if you want to set up an appointment with me, you can. Um, I do Wednesdays and Friday afternoons. Uh, Wednesdays I go into the evening, but that is a way that you can reach out to me and get in touch with me to set up an appointment and talk one-on-one. -on -one. So if you want to look at the, talk about the test optional, if you want to talk about a specific department, this is a way you can reach me. Then the other one, Here's my contact information up at the top there. So jennifer.par at du.edu. And then the 815-337-6970. That number is the one that will come directly to my office. Email is probably the best way to reach me though. Um, again, we have those virtual visits coming up. You probably have received something in the mail if you're on our mailing list, um, or you can go right to our website and check it out. We're doing virtual visits at the moment, and we do allow families to come on campus. We can't host you for a visit. We can't bring you into the actual um, buildings at this point in time. And um, at, the, at this point in time, it is October 7th. So we're looking at hopefully doing that in the upcoming months, um, but it's gonna be based on the pandemic where it is, as well as what the state and the government say we need to be doing. Our students are on campus, they're doing hybrid, high flex, and they're also doing in-person and online courses. So they're doing a combination. We have social distancing. We were fortunate enough to have that new freshman resident hall. And we opened up one of our sophomore resident halls allowing students to upgrade to suites that had individual bathrooms. So they are being very respectful of each other and they're having their classes and they're on campus right now. So thank you so much for taking time and listening to this presentation. I hope it sparked interest in DU. Um, I'd love to read your application if you're interested in. And my advice to my juniors is keep your balance. Academically, junior year, you can take a lot more things right now. And especially with, if you're doing virtual or hybrid classes, if you find one class is taking away time from another, another one kind of sucking out that energy, it's okay to drop it down. You wanna protect your GPA, you wanna challenge yourself, but you wanna keep yourself balanced. And my seniors, you guys are enduring a lot right now. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I am here for you. And again, I'll put that appointment up one more time and we'll go ahead and um, that will, and my presentation. I appreciate all your time. All right, I'm gonna share my screen one more time just to remind everyone. We wanted to say a quick thank you for joining us. Um, you will get a quick survey as you exit the session and just don't forget that at IACAC.org you can access recordings of this um, and sign up for more sessions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you and bye everybody. Have a great year.